All right. Well, again, thanks everyone for coming to the um, first uh, AGU Geodesy Early Career Webinar of the year. We're so pleased that uh, Lee Wang is going to be able to give us a uh, presentation today. Just as a brief introduction, uh, Lee Wang is currently um, an associate professor in the Department of Civil, um, Environmental, and Geodetic Sciences at the, uh, it's just like, uh, I should say, Engineering in the College of Engineering at The Ohio State University. Uh, Lee got his PhD uh, from Ohio State as well and was a postdoc at um, MIT and uh, Columbia University the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory before arriving. All right, uh, so Lee, we can see your uh, screen and your mail at the moment. <laughs> you might want to close that down. There we go. Um, so Lee, are you ready to begin? I Fortunately, we cannot hear you, so I will allow yourselves to, can you unmute yourself now, Lee? And you can probably start your video now. I should, Turn the security back on. There we go. All right, Lee, are you ready to go? Oh, yeah. Um, let me. Oh, please. Yeah, sorry. I just uh, hit the wrong button. So you can share your screen again. We should be ready to go. So Matt, can you see my uh, screen? Yes, and I can see and hear you well. So you go okay. ahead. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to this webinar. I really appreciate the opportunity to introduce uh, some research I have been doing by using uh, satellite gravimetry, that is a GRACE uh, observation and uh, some satellites altimeter data to study some uh, earth system changes. So here I just put a very general topic to say this is a earth system change. Uh, that's because my, my research interest is a little broad and uh, it's involves some interdisciplinary uh, studies. In this uh, webinar, I'm going to uh, introduce, uh, focus on two uh, topic. One is uh, to study the ice, ice sheet mice balance by using uh, uh, GRACE and uh, satellite altimeters. And the other is a great earthquake deformations um, by using uh, satellite gravity. Uh, so uh, I will first start with uh, a novel uh, GRACE data processing technique. Uh, we have developed in the past years. And then I will move to um, satellite altimeter data processing. After that, then we, I will move to the uh, uh, Great Earthquake Deformation Studies. Uh, for the GRACE um, data processing, uh, most of the people in the uh, GRACE uh, community we, we use level two data. Level two data is a spherical harmonic coefficient uh, for, for the global Earth gravity field, which are produced uh, every month. So it's a monthly global field data. Uh, there are currently three uh, official data analysis center for processing the, uh, and release the GRACE data at GPL, CSR, and GFZ. Uh, we start from using this uh, spherical harmonics provided by a given month. And if we take a look at the raw data, so this map here shows the raw grace solution for the April 2008. Uh, here I just, for example, if we just plot this uh, spherical harmonic coefficients in, uh, in the units of water thickness of centimeters, uh, if we look at the global map, then we can see this field, this raw level two gravity field actually are dominated by these types of uh, north, east, uh, north south elongated stripes. So we call this a uh, uh, strip error. Uh, so these errors are usually related to orbital errors of the great satellites uh, related to some uh, background errors like in the ocean tide models, um, some atmospheric models, right? This kind of errors 
actually can, uh, if this background noise uh, and this uh, kind of uh, uh, satellite orbital errors actually can contaminate the gravity field. And it shows up this uh, uh, elongated the strap errors. The first step is obviously in order to extract the actual geophysical signal from this strap error dominated raw data, we need to do some uh, pre processing. Uh, the pre processing uh, key step is to we call de stripe. It's like how we can remove this kind of uh, strap errors from, the, uh, from this solution and extract the, the real signal. Uh, a very uh, popular method to remove these correlated strap errors uh, is uh, first introduced by Svensson and War. Uh, that is a, a paper um, in 2006 in, published in GRL. Uh, so what they did is like they just fit some polynomials from uh, the raw uh, spherical harmonic coefficients and then remove these polynomials and think the residue are the and use this polynomial to represent or to model this uh, strap error and think the residual actually what's left after remove this polynomial is uh, act it's treated as uh, the actual signal. And then further Gaussian smoothing in space and also the Gaussian smoothing in temporal in time can be applied to further smooth the solution. Uh, this is very uh, popular and common method people use to remove these strap errors. But uh, there's a key problem for this method. It's very effective and actually it's, uh, that's, that's why it's so popular. But uh, an uh, a important uh, problem is uh, how we can assess the impact of this of such distracting procedure on the estimated signals, right? What is the uncertainty of the estimate signal after this polynomial fitted and removed? The uh, uncertainty information is particularly important for the uh, GRIS data is because the, the resolution lim limitation of the GRIS is uh, usually about th uh, 300 to 500 kilometers. And it's uh, after, you uh, this uh, strap error removed, then the residual field actually is still very noisy, right? And people, how we treat this, uh, the, 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 the estimate signal and how we assess this associated uncertainty after this pre-processing, pre after the distraping, is a, is, is a key question we have been trying to, to answer. So in order to, estimates the uncertainty and also estimates the signal. We designed this kind of a, a Bayesian processing procedure to, to precise the GRIS data. Uh, the advantage or the, or the motivation for us to develop the, such a um, method is, for, is in order to derive the, the, the statistically uh, uh, rigorous uh, uncertainty associated with the, with the estimation. Uh, what's our measure? Our measure is based on a, a, a Bayesian framework and actually is implemented by using a common filter. Oh, we call it stochastic filter. So what we do is like, instead of treat to fit the, uh, the strap error by using a ad hoc polynomial, we treat these uh, strap errors statistically. So we uh, give the some uh, a pro, we give a, a stochastic model and use this stochastic model actually uh, to to describe the stochast the statistical uh, property of the strap errors. So actually we we, we treat this strap systematic error as random walk, and also we give some uh, a priori uh, covariance for the, to describe the time dependence of the, the geophysical signal and also the spatial uh, correlations among the uh, geophysical signals. Um, and we, by using this uh, stochastic information, then we just estimate the signal and the strap noise simultaneously. 
by uh, and the raw data is the uh, level two uh, spherical harmonic coefficients of the grace uh, solution. Uh, we just put this, all this information, all the a priori uh, stochastic model and the observation models into this uh, stochastic filter. And then we run this stochastic filter sequentially in time. Now uh, it's a common filter. So the common filter can be implemented in the forward and in the backward. We do a two-way common filter. It's both a forward prediction and backward smoothing. The, uh, the, the final product produced by the uh, stochastic filter include the estimated geophysical noise and together with the strap noise, right? We, because we, we, we consider, we, we treat the strap noise as unknown parameters to estimate together with the signal parameters. And most importantly, we also have this, uh, the coherence information for both the geophysical signal estimates and the estimate strap errors. So this coherence matrix uh, is, uh, reflects the uncertainty for, for the estimated geophysical signal. So this uh, shows the results of our common filter um, processing. Here, I just pick out one month uh, to show the results. Uh, so this is for the 2004 uh, August. Then you can see it's, this is the raw data is dominated by strep errors. After we run the uh, uh, common filter, then this is what we estimated the mass anomaly. So these are the true geophysical signals produced by the future together with its uncertainty, right? So this uncertainty, uh, you can see it's a spatially, uh, is, is spatially dependent. And also it's produced this estimate strap noise, right? And it's uncertainty. So our, this figure actually shows the, our common filter actually can effectively separate the geophysical signal and the strap noise. So in the geophysical signal, then we can see this kind of uh, obvious uh, hydrological um, mass changes uh, over the Southeast Asia, right? Or uh, in the Congo Basin, in the Amazon. Uh, this strap no uh, noise is, uh, uh, shows little uh, geophysical signatures and plus the residual. So that is the, what our common filter do the separation. And we just use this kind of information to do some further study for the hydrological cycle, um, uh, um, terrestrial water storage changes for the ice sheets mass changes over the major glaciers. Uh, and the, we also wanted to take one, uh, take one, uh, take advantage of this kind of uncertainty uh, information associated with this uh, um, uh, geophysical signal generated by the uh, stochastic field. Uh, th this slide shows uh, the uh, the degree variance. So the red one line actually shows the the degree variance of the uh, raw gravity field. And uh, this uh, red curve shows the degree variance. So in the raw, da raw data, which is showed by this uh, blue line, then we can see at the high degree and other, uh, the, the degree variance is blued up. That reflects the dominance of the strep errors in the raw data, particularly at this high degree and others. Uh, but after the filtering, um, we can effectively surprise this uh, high degree and the other noise. Uh, these are the direct uh, uh, outputs of the common filter without any uh, spatial filtering. Uh, this is because is, this is another advantage of, of method is uh, this, uh, there, there's no need to do any Gaussian smoothing. Uh, the spatial Gaussian smoothing is necessary if people choose to use this kind of ad hoc polynomial fit to remove the strap error. After that, then we need to apply another Gaussian smoothing step in order to make the geophysical signal estimates 
to be more spatially smooth. But in our methods, it can directly output the, uh, the smoothest estimates reflect the, the natural resolution uh, of the geophysical signal under the uh, impact of the correlated noise. Um, so you can see the common filter generated estimates is pretty, co pretty consistent with the, with the estimates after we apply a 1,000 kilometer Gaussian smoothing. Uh, if we look at, uh, focus on a region, is this is Antarctica, then you can see this is the raw data. And actually, uh, for uh, we can, oh, we can, in our uh, common filter, actually, we have some uh, flexibility to as to how we apply the uh, spatial correlation constraint. Uh, so I just want to show this uh, in uh, Antarctica. Actually, we have this kind of different uh, drainage basins. Uh, we can make assumption to say, OK, the uh, mass change within uh, within one drainage basin are spatially correlated. Uh, and they, you, we can also assume the mass change between different basins are uncorrelated. So if we, we can implement such uh, spatial correlation constraint into the common filter, then if we can do that, uh, then we can see these are the estimated mass anomaly by the common filter. And also here is uh, the uh, associated uncertainty estimates uh, output uh, uh, for uh, generated by the common field. Uh, so here you can see your, if we estimate the Antarctica mass change, mass anomaly over Antarctica, then we can see along the margin of the Antarctica ice sheets, uh, the common filter generates a higher uncertainty. So I will say this is a, the, the, the main power of our method is the uncertainty estimates. It's because this, this, this is a pretty, uh, for, for grace, we all know the grace, the limitation is a spatial resolution. It's usually just several hundred, 300 kilometers. So it's more, uh, it, it could be dangerous if we use grace data to study the mass change over uh, some localized mass change. For example, in this case, in the Antarctica Peninsula, it's a small region. Uh, grace usually do not have the, the, the sufficient resolution power to accurately estimate, to determine the mass change over such small um, local signals. So that, that this kind of facts can, can be told by the uncertainty estimates produced by the filter. This you can see at the Antarctic Peninsula over filter actually generates a bigger uncertainty. Right? So this is a, um, the, the, our master always wanted to address is not only provide the estimates, but also provide the uncertainty information so that the user can understand uh, the potential errors right, in a given data type. In this case, the GRACE observation. Uh, again, it separates the strep errors from the geophysical signal. Uh, our filter can do that. Uh, so here, we, the, the, the common filter actually is run over time. We just process the decade long GRACE data from 2003 all the way to uh, to 2020. Um, actually, we combined GRACE mission and the GRACE follow-on mission. The, the, the common filter actually can, can combine the data sets from these two missions. Um, we, in order to assess the, the compare of the common filter output and uh, the, the mass contribution. So here, uh, the mass contribution is uh, provided by LAFKI. Uh, they just estimate the, the mass change over Antarctica directly from the GRACE uh, orbital data. Uh, it's not from the level two gra uh, gravitation, uh, gravity spherical harmonic coefficients. But if we compare our solution with the mass contribution, 
then we can see along this, uh, 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 we just compare them uh, over different uh, drainage basins. And we can see for these basins, they are pretty consistent with each other. Both of them uh, reflect some uh, spatial variations over the time. And uh, also over some uh, basins, it uh, shows the the Kimau land, then you can see during uh, in starting from uh, 2009, there is a extreme snowfall event, and both solution or our filter and the mass con solution reveals and detected this uh, uh, extreme uh, snowfall event. Both solution uh, measures this uh, continuous uh, mass gain uh, along uh, Cam Ice Stream. Uh, this along the Amundsen C sector, it's a both solution detects this uh, continuous and accelerating uh, mass, mass uh, loss. But uh, at this uh, Antarctic Peninsula, then this solution started to diverge. It shows a degree of uh, discrepancy. But as I um, mentioned in the last slides, right, our solution actually, this uh, green bars shows the uncertainties generated by the common filter. Then it's because our common filter already say, okay, because the, the, the small area, the, the, the small scale, spatial scale uh, over the Antarctic Peninsula, then this uh, discrepancy actually is, a, is a understandable. Right? Uh, so here, after uh, based on the data and our uh, uh, grid processing results of our common filter, then we just focused on uh, how we model the uh, Antarctica ice sheets mass change. So uh, uh, the grid uh, observation actually is, is a key data set used, uh, can be used to study the um, mass balance over the Antarctic ice sheets. The, the Antarctic ice sheets mass balance actually reflects the, the night change um, in between the, the, the mass gain from the, the snowfall and the mass loss from the melting and runoff. Uh, so before 2012, there are different techniques we can use to study the Antarctica uh, ice sheets mass balance, uh, including the satellite gravimetry, or we can use either uh, radar altimetry or laser altimetry. Uh, also, we can use this uh, uh, purely based on the model, right? We can use the mass budget method. So for the studies before, uh, people interested is like, what's the, the, the rate, right? Of the mass loss over Antarctica entire Antarctica or different uh, uh, regions of the Antarctic, how fast the mass, uh, how fast these regions are gaining or losing mass. Usually people want to uh, use a constant rate by fitting the data over, by fitting observation over a given uh, time period. Uh, so uh, you can, uh, we can see uh, for Greece, data is only available in starting from 2002 up to now. Then we can see, okay, th th then we can estimate a rate by using the grace. And that's rate actually is spending the grace observation uh, period. Uh, and the, for satellite radar altimetry, for example, then the period do not overlap with the grace data, then the, they can use a, this uh, rate, rate altimetry data period to estimate another rate. Uh, then people can compare, want to compare the fitted linear rate from different smizer to see how well they coincide with each other. Uh, so before uh, 2012, and we can see the constant linear rate that's usually uh, pressed as a DMDT, as the, the mass change rate. Uh, by using different methods. Before 2012, then these rates, the estimated linear rates are pretty diverse. Uh, it can change 
can vary from about minus 330 gigaton per year up to positive 50 uh, gigaton per year. So, so different methods estimate rates, their results are not consistent with, with each other. But after 2012, then for, for this, we, our results, we, our estimates started to converge with each other. Uh, it's just located, the, the, the uncertainty or the discrepancy is usually uh, in, in between minus 100 to plus 100 gigaton per year. Uh, but we can still see some uh, discrepancies, right? particularly for this radar altimeter uh, for this grace. Their discrepancy one's uh, plus, one's, uh, one is positive, the other is negative. So such great discrepancy, um, there are several factors contributes to such discrepancy. One is of course that uh, different data, different data have different uh, resolution, different error sources. Uh, that, that's obviously a street, uh, a, a very obvious factor contributes to discrepancy. But another uh, important factor is uh, the mass change of the Antarctic ice sheets, the mass change rate is not constant over time. Uh, they can, they are variable from one time to the other. So that's why if these two data sets, one is altimeter, the other is grace, if their observation period are not um, overlap with, with each other, then actually they can actually re really measure the different rates. Right? So uh, this can be explained better if we look at these uh, slides. This shows the time series of the uh, ice mass balance determined by using the GRACE and GRACE follow-on <clears throat> data. Then uh, we just separate the Antarctica region into East Antarctica, West Antarctica, and the Antarctica Peninsula. And this last slide, this plot shows the entire Antarctica mass balance. Then we can see over different period for each section of the Antarctica ice sheets, they all show the significant variability of the of a linear rate. Right? So if we fit this time series, we fit a linear rate by using different uh, time period. So each this uh, uh, straight line I just denote it by using different color, and shows the fitted rate. By uh, over different period, this is before 2008, then from 2008 to 2012. Then you can see how significantly this fitted linear rate can change from time to time. Uh, so that's is a give us a a question is whether or not the Antarctica mass change rate can should be fitted as a constant. It's important this because we usually use the fitted rates to project the future change of the Antarctic ice sheets and for the and also uh, and consequently the, the sea level change. Right? If we just use a given period of data and fit a constant rate, and then we just extrapolate it into in, in the future 50 years, for example, then if this rate, the fitted constant rate actually can change from time to time, then this extrapolated uh, future change can bear a great degree of uncertainties. So that's why we, we are motivated to say, we wanted to estimate this rate as a time dependent parameter. Instead of a linear constant rate, we just wanted to model this rate as a time dependent uh, parameter. <clears throat> So that's the results uh, we, 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 we got. Uh, it's, uh, we take the uh, GRACE time series over the Antarctica and over different regions. Then the, and then we just use the form the time series. Then we can model the rate as time variable parameter and uh, estimate these time dependent rates together with its uncertainty. Then we can see for, from both uh, East Antarctica, West Antarctica, uh, 
both sections shows the uh, significant uh, temporal variabilities, uh, also the Antarctic Peninsula. So if we <coughs> sum all these sections all together, then you can see for the Antarctic, entire Antarctic ice sheets, then this kind of a temporal variability of the rate is uh, also very significant. So this plot shows the x-axis is the time and the y-axis is the estimated rate for a given epoch. Uh, uh, this uh, black uh, shaded area shows uh, denotes the gap in between Greece and Greece follow on uh, missions because there is no, uh, no data uh, during this period. After we have this, uh, time dependent rate, then we can estimate, uh, we, we can do the, we can calculate the power, uh, the, the, the power spectrum of density uh, from this uh, time dependent rate time series in order to assess the, uh, the temporal scale and the magnitude of such fluctuations in the mass change rate. Uh, if, if we, if, if this uh, figure B shows the uh, estimated PSD, uh, then we can see this uh, purple line shows the entire Antarctica, the fluctu the, the power spectrum of the fluctuations in rate. Uh, then you can see over different time period, then the magnitude are not the same. Uh, so the Question is like what, what which, which part contributes to to the uh, fluctuation at different period? Then we just uh, do the same thing. We calculate the, the power spectrum density for uh, East Antarctica, West Antarctica, and Antarctic Peninsula. After we do that, then we can see at the time period of about seventeen years, then the fluctuation in the, uh, in the rates over the entire overall Antarctic ice sheets mass change. The fluctuation actually is uh, dominated by West Antarctica, right? That's it's a, it's a losing mass and uh, uh, the fluctu fluctuation in the rate change is mainly due to the deceleration, uh, acceleration in the, in the mass change. <clears throat> But if we look at this uh, a shorter time period, it's about eight year, uh, 10 year, right? Then it's started to dominate by the uh, East Antarctic. Then the variations, that is uh, the mass loss from the West Antarctic is uh, characterized by a uh, multi-decadal trend. And it's at the multi-decadal time period, it's the West Antarctic, uh, trend, mass loss trend actually dominates the entire Antarctic ice mass change. But at the shorter period, at about eight, eight, eight years, 10 years, then it started to be dominated by the East Antarctic. That's East Antarctic uh, <clears throat> mass gain actually is a, reflects some substantial short-term accumulations change. That's where it dominates the, the in, entire Antarctic mass change trend. So this study, uh, if we, uh, here is like, we, when we have the time dependent rates, then we can calculate the, uh, the yearly mean of such, uh, we have monthly rates, then we just take the mean, calculate the mean for each year. Then we can say, uh, these are the <clears throat> yearly average of the time variable rates uh, produced by the satellites and uh, great, great satellites observation. And then we can having by uh, after having this uh, yearly average, then we can calculate the standard deviation of the rates uh, fluctuation. Then we can say we can see uh, we we can further based on this uh, standard deviation map, we, uh, we can uh, identify the regions that shows the largest fluctuation in the West Antarctic. They are uh, along the Amundsen Sea coast, uh, but also in the East Antarctic, usually people think East Antarctic are pretty stable, but East Antarctic along, some, along this uh, Queen Moorland, uh, along this uh, uh, Wilkes uh, 
coast region, actually here uh, in, uh, enclosed the Totten Glacier. It also shows this uh, great fluctuation. So uh, <clears throat> the conclusion is uh, the East Antarctica actually has an increasingly uh, active and influential role in the entire Antarctic ashes mass balance evolution. Uh, it's not stable, particularly for this uh, Totten Glacier. Uh, over the years, it shows uh, uh, accelerated the mass change. So it's uh, in the future we can project this uh, East Antarctica can more uh, can, can be uh, will become more and more influential influential in determining the entire uh, in affecting the entire uh, Antarctic ice mass balance. Uh, <clears throat> so after the grace and the grace uh, follow on, I I just wanted to uh, discuss some work we have been doing by combine the uh, satellite altimeter uh, data. So for satellite altimetry, we have some, uh, uh, over the years, we have different uh, satellite altimetry missions. We have the uh, ESR, we have some radar altimetry. We have also as uh, ISAT, ISAT2, this uh, 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 laser altimeter mission. Also, we have some uh, uh, future proposed mission to be launched in the future years. Uh, so if we be able to, if we can combine these uh, different data sets all together and form a long time series from uh, altimeter data, then we can uh, get this kind of very similar uh, analysis to study the rate fluctuation, to study the, the different roles of different sector of the ice sheets uh, in affecting the, uh, the total mass balance of the Antarctic ice sheets. Uh, but for so here, this study uh, is focused on how we can combine the uh, laser and radar altimeter data. Uh, each data actually, the the challenge is like the radar and the laser uh, data. They have different resolution of different spatial resolutions. For the radar, it's usually uh, can be several kilometer, um, even twenty kilometer. But for the laser, usually it's uh, several meters. Uh, how we can combine is, is uh, one uh, is one challenge. The other is like they have different measurements quality, right? For the uh, the laser can measure the surface elevation even over the the the, the, the sloping area, uh, particularly along the the margin of the ice sheets. But for the radar, uh, for the uh, ice sheets, is uh, the margin of the ice sheets is usually produce a very coarse. Uh, measurements. Uh, also, they have different error characteristics. Uh, for example, the, the radar pores actually can penetrate the ice, ice surface and subjects to this kind of a volume backscatter. So these are different error characteristics when compared to the laser. So in order to combine the laser and the radar altimeter data, the first step we just wanted to un uh, understand what's the precision in the radar uh, measurements was a precision in the uh, laser uh, and uh, whether or not there, there exists any uh, bias in between the radar and the laser collective surface elevation measurements. So we just based on uh, such uh, precision and the bias analysis is based on the, this uh, crossover analysis. Uh, <clears throat> we, we, we just pick up uh, a descending track, uh, one ascending track at the crossover points, uh, theoretically, if there's no error at all, then the, the measurements at the, at the crossover should be exactly the same. As long as the, 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 these two data, the ascending track and the ascending, descending track, their, their time separation is not too long. <clears throat> so we can compare the, the measurements for, uh, from a, a single mission a laser or radar, or we can also compare the measurements across different missions at the crossover. Then we can calculate the, the height difference either between the measurements of the same uh, mission or, or across the mission. We just use this height difference to assess the precision and the, the, the intermission bias. So this result shows the, the precision we we estimate this is we ask we we estimate it for the this is for the cryo side two. No, I think this is for so, sorry for the typo. This is for the I side two. Uh, 
uh, we assessed the, the precision of the SI2 surface elevation measurements uh, over the spatial uh, distribution of this uh, precision uh, over Antarctica and uh, the Greenland. And then we can see in the interior of the ice sheets, the precision is pretty high. It's uh, usually is several centimeters, but along the margin is subject to a uh, bigger errors and it can be uh, less than one meter. Uh, and it's related to the topography. So this, uh, the lower panel just shows the topography of the ice sheets, uh, Antarctica and the Greenland. Uh, uh, this uh, plot shows we just applied we applied the same crossover analysis, but used to assess the cryosat two uh, uh, radar altimeter uh, measured surface elevation. They, they, they are for for different mode of the SI two uh, altimeter, including the low resolution mode, uh, sorry mode, and also these are uh, elevation are. Uh, Obtained uh, are processed by using different attractor, uh, re re uh, retractors. So we just uh, assess their precision and their um, spatial distribution. Uh, also, here uh, we uh, assess by using the crossover analysis. What we assess the the um, intermission bias in between the cryosat two and isat two uh, over green uh, Antarctica. And the Greenland for uh, so we can see the uh, this uh, intermission bias actually is not uh, constant uh, in the space. Right, it, it has this uh, significant uh, spatial uh, variations. The same thing for for the Greenland. Uh, these uh, bias they are uh, spatially uh, heterogeneous. After we have the um, precision and uh, uh, the, the bias information, then we can combine the, the measurements from uh, ISAT1, uh, cryosat 2 radar altimeter, and ISAT2 data. Uh, what we do is like, first, we just uh, uh, process the data for, from each mission separately. So we can get the, uh, we correct for the terrain effects, we correct for the backstack scatter effect for the radar altimeter. Uh, and then, then we can get this uh, uh, time series uh, from each uh, mission. Right? This uh, red dot shows the uh, I set one, uh, blue is the cryo set two, and this uh, green is I set two. So after we cracked for the, the, the terrain and the back secondary effect, then we just apply this uh, estimated uh, intermission bias to here to align the, the time series from different missions altogether. Then these are the aligned data after we cracked for this uh, intermission bias. And then we just have this uh, time series which are already aligned. And then we just uh, 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 reference them to the epoch of uh, uh, January 2010. We think, okay, we just say, we use 2010 as a reference epoch, and then we determine the, the, the change relative to this reference epoch. So this uh, uh, plot shows the aligned combined uh, time series of the surface elevation changes determined by using ISAT1, cryosite 2 and ISAT2. So you can see we can have this kind of uh, about two decades long uh, time series. So we do this one over Antarctica. So here it shows the, the monthly uh, surface elevation determined by combining the, the radar and the laser altimeter all together, uh, together with its uncertainty. Uh, so these are the monthly change and their monthly uh, uncertainties. After we doing this one, so currently what we have been working on is like we wanted to have this monthly altimeter data and to combine with the monthly grace data so that we can combine the, uh, we, we can get a uh, uh, Antarctica ice mass balance estimation by statistically, uh, statistically uh, rigorously combine both grace and the uh, uh, altimetry mission. So our altimetry 
uh, results are further validated by using the ice bridge data. Uh, so this uh, line shows the uh, ice bridge uh, flight route. Then we just compare our uh, altimeter estimation estimates with the estimate uh, with with the ice bridge data. Uh, So here, the, 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 so it shows the difference. It, it shows the, the, the uh, this plot shows the medium of the, the difference. Uh, and the C actually shows the topography. Uh, we just do some statistics, uh, then we can see the uncertainty, actually the, the, the difference between our estimates and the ice bridge data actually is uh, about, uh, it can change from zero centimeter to about 16 centimeter. And it's also uh, uh, shows some uh, de uh, dependence uh, on this uh, topography. As the uh, slope increase, then we can start to have the bigger uh, discrepancy. Uh, it's uh, the, the maximum magnitude of the medium value is about 16 centimeter, which is pretty consistent, uh, consistent with our uncertainty estimates. Uh, so here, this plot just shows the time series. We, uh, by combining these uh, three altimeter, uh, altimetry uh, missions uh, over these uh, major uh, outlet glaciers, uh, the, the plots I just wanted to show the uh, non secular signals. Uh, it's like uh, similar to what I uh, mentioned for the GRACE results. It's not proper to describe to to model the mass change by using a linear constant rates. It's better for us. We can see, particularly for the Hellman, take the Hellman glacier for example, the change of the elevation of surface elevation actually can. It's really uh, depends on time. So it's also it's the same thing uh, for the altimetry data. When we get this long time series, it's better to, uh, we, we will be able to estimate the time dependent surface ele ele elevation change rate, uh, just similar to what we, we did for, by using the GRACE data. Uh, so that is uh, the, the, it's our ongoing uh, research we are, we are doing. It's like to combine GRACE and altimeter and then to derive the time dependent rate as a final uh, product. Uh, the, the last uh, thing uh, is about um, we use uh, um, satellite gravimetry to study the um, great earthquake deformations. Um, so the satellite uh, gravity actually can complement the more conventional traditional uh, geodetic observations to to study uh, earthquake earth, earth deformation. So, uh, it, it has some advantage uh, for, for, for example. It has some advantages because it can sense the deformation both onshore and offshore. This the GPS cannot measure the, the deformation on the seafloor directly, but the, the, the satellites uh, gravity can sense this deformation on the surface. Also, it can sense the deformation uh, uh, also at the depths, for example, in the asthenosphere uh, in the upper mantle. So that's, that's some advantage of the uh, satellite uh, gravimetry, but it also has a, a significant drawbacks. The first one is, uh, is, uh, is resolution, spatial, both spatial and the temporal are pretty coarse. And also it's a noise, it's, uh, it's a pretty noisy data set and how we, we need to be very careful to treat the noise, particularly to study the earthquake signal, which are usually uh, pretty localized. Um, so it has some uh, developments by using the GRACE data to study the earthquake deformation. So the, the, uh, at the very beginning, people just use the GRACE detected geoid change to try to identify the, the, the extent and the distribution of the, of the, of the deformation uh, due to a great earthquake. Uh, 
But later, people wanted to improve the uh, spatial resolution. Then people just use uh, uh, gravity to uh, this called cosmic gravity to quantify the deformation. And further, we can take another derivative. We can use the gravitational gradients as detected by the GRIS uh, satellites to uh, further improve the spatial uh, resolution of the detected deformation. Uh, so we can see it, when we use a gravity, a gravitational gradients to detect the, the deformation, when compared to the geo, uh, geoid change, then you can see it uh, reveals more uh, detailed spatial um, distributions. So over the years, we, uh, we also have different uh, uh, data analytics, uh, particularly for by using the localized basis, like the sleeping basis, to further enhance the signal to noise resolution, uh, a, a sig signal to noise ratio of the detected uh, gravity uh, change due to a great earthquake by, by Greece. So it has been uh, a lot of study has uh, demonstrates that Greece is able to detect the co-seismic deformation, also able to uh, detect the co make deformation. But uh, uh, recently, uh, some study also show the GRACE actually has a unique power to um, detect some uh, pre-seismic deformation. So this study uh, are, uh, has been done by a panic at all in 2008. Uh, it's published in uh, Nature Geoscience. So they, uh, they analyze the GRACE data, the gravitational gradient change and reveals this kind of a pre-seismic deformation, uh, a pre-seismic signal. So they just, uh, the main shock of uh, here, the results is about the uh, 2011 Tohoku uh, Oki earthquake. So this is a main shock, uh, which is on March 2011. And by using the GRIS data, this study Panic at all these also detect this uh, pre-seismic deformation, which is uh, initiated in uh, starting summer months before the main shock, and then they just uh, they further interpret it. It this a uh, seismic signal as uh, the large scale a seismic movements of the sub subducting slab along the trench at about three hundred kilometer depth. Uh, they, they also think this is a triggering process uh, of the main shock. Uh, if we look at the, this time, the GRACE time series, so uh, these are results are from uh, Panic et al. 2018. Then uh, the, the results, they, they, they show these uh, two, the red dot shows the, the main shock observation, and these uh, two blue dots shows this pre precise mix signal at different location, then they just shows this, uh, uh, Precise the existence of these uh, such precise make uh, anomalies in the gray state. Uh, another study is published by Backboard et al. in 2021. They analyzed the GPS data, and then the in their GPS data they also shows detected this kind of systematic wobbles. Uh, these are the uh, time series position uh, time series of the stations. Uh, over over Japan, then you can see this is several months before the main shock. Then all this uh, station over over Japan actually has this systematic wobbles. So it seemingly corroborate the the, the GRACE observation. Um, another recent more recent paper by Pan et al. in two thousand twenty. They all they all show such pre pre-seismic uh, anomaly also existed for the uh, uh, Mali Chile earthquake in 2010. Uh, they, they apply the same very similar uh, gradient analysis. Then this you can see here the red dot shows the, the main, main shock epoch, the, uh, the gradient anomaly as the main shock epoch. And this uh, uh, blue and the, the green are the two data points associated with the two months before the main shock. Then you can see the results shows, this is a 
even before the main shock, then this kind of anomaly started already, it already started to initiate. So they just explain this uh, precise, precise me anomaly by using the similar mechanism as this uh, uh, Tohoku occurs precise mix signal. Uh, same thing for the GPS uh, time series by the backward at all in 2020. Then it shows this kind of systematic wobbles over the stations, uh, 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 at the stations over the Chile area. Uh, in order to test whether or not such um, Precisimic anomaly are significant, so we just uh, we, we we designed a, a stochastic a, a, a statistical test. Uh, what we do is like we we wanted to test the, the statistical significance of uh, us assume the precisimic uh, rate change, uh, and we just assume there is a rate which is initiated several months before the main shock. We fit a rate, and then we we test whether or the, we also estimate its significance level. To when this significance level is large enough, then we say, okay, this there is indeed a, a precise rate existing. Otherwise, if we have another, we get a very small significance level. In this case, it's a, in this time series, it's a zero point one two three. Then we we just. Uh, Reject the, the the assumption of the precisimic, the existence of the precisimic anomaly. So I, I, the here really these two dots, which is a two months before the main shock, there is not significant anomaly existed. So you can see correspondingly the significance level is very small. We just apply this uh, significance level test, uh, 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 statistical test to uh, the Grace time series at different locations, and then we can see uh, for this dot, right? So this time series, the blue time series are uh, derived from the Kness solution. So it, the, the, this solution is a, a great solution is a produced really by, uh, by, by the France, by France Institute of Kness. We, if we look at their solution, then at this uh, different location, one, two, three, four, five, they are showed in this uh, uh, green uh, curve. This is the uh, time series of the gradient change. And th this number shows the significance. Then we, we can really sh see there are indeed some significant precismic existed for this across uh, at these uh, uh, locations over Japan region. But if we go to the regions out of the Japan, uh, we can still see some uh, uh, re points that shows a big uh, significance values. That means at these locations, even they are very far away from the, the seismic region over Japan, but it also shows this kind of a, a significant uh, gradient anomaly before the main shock of the Japan. Of, 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 of the Tohoku Oki earthquake. So that, that's, uh, uh, let us think whether or not this detected pre-seismic is really associated with the uh, geophysical uh, process or if they are just reflect the uh, degrees noise or some other um, signals, hydrology, hydrology signal. Or, or, or some ocean mass changes. Uh, we also uh, compare the our, uh, uh, we processed another uh, grid solution. In this case, it's uh, the grid solution from CSR. Then we can see the CSR data, actually, if we compare these two solutions, this uh, plot shows the significance level uh, over this region. Then we can see in the uh, connect solution, it shows the, the pattern of the uh, pre-seismic anomaly are totally different from the, the pattern as revealed by the CSR solution. Particularly for these two, for example, in these two points, five and six, if we, if we look at the connect solution, at the five and six, it really shows significant 
uh, the existence of the pre-seismic anomaly. But if we look at the CSR solution for the same points, then the such existence there is really is no significant pre-seismic anomaly existing. So if we compare these two solutions, that's another reason for us to think about why, whether or not these are detected pre-seismic. It's really significantly, uh, statistically significant. Lee, also, could, you, could you find your last slide? We're uh, just about out of time. Uh, I'm, I'm all done. Matt, I'm, okay, I'm, that, you're you're I, done. I, okay, <laughs> I'm almost done. So this okay, is okay, okay, good. So we also uh, test the existence of the so we also uh, do the apply the test over time. Then we also look and see this kind of a the, the precise make anomaly or some of the sun anomaly also can exist over different times. Uh, that, that gives us, uh, that's motivate us to working on a current projects. This is a collaboration between uh, Roland, Vermont, uh, UC Berkeley and our group. It's so we trying to combine the grace, also combined with the GPS data and also with the geodynamic model to uh, to 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 check the 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 whether or not there is a, a physically uh, reasonable geodetic model can explain the grace detected gravity change and also the gps measure the displacement try to further check the the robustness of the assumption of this uh, uh, the existence of the pre-seismic deformation so uh, that's all. Sorry for uh, for taking uh, too long, <laughs> but I tried to pack too much things to this uh, webinar. But uh, thank you for your attention, and thanks, Matt. Oh, great! Thanks so much, Lee. I really that was a great talk. Really enjoyed it. Um, I'm going to um, open up the chat and allow people to unmute themselves. If anyone has a question, you should be able to raise your hand at the moment. Um, so I'll just get, wait a second here and see if anyone uh, wants to chime up with the first question. Um, I this, oh yeah, um, I have a question. I, uh, Dr. Wan, thank you for the uh, very uh, nice presentation. So I just have a question back to very earlier slide. You uh, you give us a plot of the uncertainty and the mass anomaly mass change anomaly map for the Antarctic. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, this one, this this one, yeah. So it. Cause, Cause, like, what I can see here, like the middle two, um, I feel like the uncertainty everywhere will exceed the the signal we measure. Is that true? <laughs> like, I mean, if we compare the the middle two plot, top and the bottom, um, feel like like the. I mean, everywhere the uncertainty is like above 20 centimeter, right? Is that true? But the, the signal, most of the place, the signal is way, way below 20, right? Does that mean like we cannot uh, really see anything here or everything yeah. we saw here is like noise? Uh, uh, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a very good question. Um, no, it's it's not this. Uh, first of all, this this is just a, the the estimation for a month, right? Mm -hmm. So, it, it's you 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 already people you you the grace. Then we can for particular for Antarctica. Then we fit a trend. So if you fit a trend, then the uncertainty will be you you cannot think that that's that's 
the, the uncertainty of the trend will be uh, downgrade. But but here, this uncertainty basically reflects if you take uh, any pixel here. So I, I use uh, the, um, this basically I separates the one degree by one degree. Mm -hmm. uh, then I estimate the, 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 the mass change for each one degree to one degree cell. Uh, this uncertainty actually are associated with the estimates for this one degree by one degree cell. That's we, we we all know is a great um, resolution is about three to uh, five hundred kilometers. It's uh, about if we just want use one degree, it's about three to to five degrees, right? But if uh -huh. you one degree by one degree, that is really beyond the the spatial resolution of the grids. So that's why uh, it shows such big. Uh, uh, okay. uh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. But if you if you do um, if you wanted to estimate the time series or the mass change for a given basin, then you just take all the cells over this basin and then take the average. Mm -hmm. After that, then this uh, this uh, um, uncertainty will uh, will decrease. Okay. After you do the average. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Do we have any other questions? All right. Um, well, I guess I'll ask a question then. Um, I was uh, really interested in the the earthquake part, talking about the looking for the precursory signal. So I, I'm just um, I know I rushed you a little bit at the end, but I'm just sort of wondering what is your your take home message? It's it, it, my my sort of reading of it was that um, you know you're finding different uh, patterns with the different solutions, uh, as well as the fact that you're finding potentially um, similar signals uh, at different places around the world. And so for both of those reasons, it might be um, sort of unclear exactly the, the nature of this uh, pre-seismic signal from either the, the Chile or the Japanese earthquakes. Yeah, the, the take home message, I, I, so um, yeah, I have been thinking about this uh, for quite a while and I'm, I'm still thinking about this uh, this problem is uh, for, for, for Greece, actually, we can we really can see such uh, discrepancies. If we, we just use the uh, data products released by different uh, data product center. Here, I compare the, the CSR product and the, the CNES uh, product. They, this shows this kind of a discrepancy. Then people also, uh, on the other hand, people may want to argue why you think CSR is right, but CNES is not right. Uh, so that's just uh, one thing I'm thinking is like how we can reconcile the, the, the data products um, from different data centers. So that is obviously one thing um, I, I wanna, I'm currently working on. The other is like, we, we have GPS measurements on the surface. Uh, then the people say the grace actually can detect the deformation at the depth, um, 300 kilometers. So how we can relate the depth observation by grace and the surface observation by GPS, how we can bridge these two. Uh, so that's why I'm thinking these uh, um, geodynamic deformation models can kick in. Uh, then whether or not we can find up plausible model that can both explain the gravity change detect as detected by the grace and also uh, explain the, the surface deformation as detected by grace. If we can find a such model that can really relate these two, particularly for the pre-seismic signals, then we can say, oh, that's probably our very exciting scientific um, discovery as we didn't know, at least. So here uh, I have been um, collaborating with Roland to um, trying to use combine different data, trying to constrain, to try to understand whether or not what kind of a physical mechanism can explain this uh, observed data. <clears throat> Great, thank you. Um, any other final questions? 
All right, not seeing any. I guess we'll thank you again, Lee, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to post this recording soon. And um, our next webinar is coming up on uh, February 24th. So we hope that you will all be able to join us then. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Matt.